Yeah. Good. Okay, um, welcome everyone to uh, Social Work Action Network's podcast for today. We're going to be discussing the issue of women's aggression and domestic violence in the time of COVID-19. Um, my name is Laura Owens. I'm a former social worker and former um, steering group member of SWAN. I'd like to introduce you all to Lindsay German, um, who is the National Coordinator of Stop the War Coalition as well as having an active role on the steering committee of the People's Assembly. Um, Lindsay has also written many books around um, the issue of women's aggression and teaches diversity and equality at the University of uh, Hertfordshire. So thanks for being here, Lindsay. Um, we've got Elisa, who is a frontline children and family social worker. Um, she's a long-standing steering group member of SWAN also. And finally, we've got Rebecca, who has also been um, a children families frontline social worker. She's got um, lots of experience in children's residential care, but she recently moved to mental health services. So thanks very much for being here today, guys. Um, I'd like to start off by asking Lindsay, um, over the last few weeks of lockdown, we have heard increasing stories about the rise in domestic violence, about a return to traditional gendered roles in the family unit. And I wondered how we can begin to understand this further. Um, what is women's oppression and where does it come from, Lindsay? Okay, well, thanks, Laura. I, the question of where women's oppression comes from and uh, uh, you know how long it's been around. I mean, it's been around thousands of years, but I suppose if we want to kind of narrow it down to what we're talking about now, I think that the what's really happening is that we live in a deeply unequal society and because um, things like the crisis around coronavirus kind of highlight those inequalities we see in this with the number of BME uh, people who are apparently suffering from um, from the virus and, and dying from the virus in in disproportionate numbers and of course with women I think it very much reflects women's subordinate role that for many many years women have been expected to uh, carry out some of the poorest paid jobs if you look at the uh, 10 poorest paid jobs in Britain they're very heavily female dominated and of course we live in a very um, sexually se segregated job market that men and women tend to do different jobs and when they do the same jobs men are usually higher up the scale and they're more likely to be heads of school more likely to be higher up social workers or social work managers um, so you've got that kind of situation and of course as well as that you've got women um, playing a, a a fundamentally important role in terms of what's very often called social reproduction which means how we get the next generation and the existing generation looked after, fed, cared for, the house cleaned up, all the things that I think all of us, I'm not saying it's only women do these things, but we know I think pretty much that the, um, the role of women is not just to work outside of the home, but it's also to carry the burden of, of a lot that goes on inside the home. So I think what you're seeing here, you're seeing that family structure has relied very heavily over the last few decades now because of the cuts it's relied very very heavily on people doing unpaid labor in the home caring for not just children but for the sick for the old for all sorts of people the disabled people who can't do things for themselves and of people having to carry out lots of roles in the home that they wouldn't um, they shouldn't have to do as well as working eight or ten hours a day outside of the home so i think if you look at it in those terms women are very much put in that spot and of course they're also there's kind of all sorts of attitudes towards women um, that they're both expected to go out to work and be ideal mothers but also they're expected to have ideal relationships and actually these things are pretty much impossible you know we're not super women we're normal human beings with all the constraints particularly if we don't have a lot of money or we're on benefits and all those sorts of things so i think these are some of the issues and i know your other guests are going to talk about the whole question of domestic violence and so on but it seems to me almost inevitable in the situation we're in now that the pressures already on the family in normal times so-called normal times will be much much greater and women will bear the brunt of this whether it's uh, being in a violent relationship 
or whether it's just simply do you have enough money to get food for your kids or do you have the time to go to the supermarket all those different things i think women are really bearing the brunt of this very very hard thank you lindsay that that's it has um given us some sort of context to take it forward and um, that was really really helpful uh, Alisa, if i can move on to yourself um as a social worker have you noticed an increase in domestic violence and if so, how is it that you are seeing um, social work agencies and services uh, respond to, to uh, women in that crisis? Um, this, is, this is interesting reflecting upon it because um, I'm quite concerned about the conclusion that I've come to when I've, when I've thought about this, which I have done now for two months and I've spoken to my colleagues a lot. In a nutshell, we're concerned that we aren't seeing an increase in in dv referrals coming through mm -hmm. um so and and when and we're certainly not seeing an overt strategy of how to deal with domestic violence in in the current working context so given the restrictions on us as frontline workers so to give you a little bit of background i work in a very multicultural city um so i've been waiting I've been waiting for the impact of coronavirus on on different ethnicities to, to bleed through into our referrals. I'm not I'm not getting I'm not getting that at the moment. It's a very working class city. Um, it's a it's it's a proper labour heartland. Um, and you know, so inequality, as Lindsay was just talking about, is a very important issue in our city. Um, there, at the moment there's no obvious change in the type of referrals we're receiving i think we were expecting uh, an increase in in child protection referrals as opposed to the next level down children in need referrals we were expecting that we were expecting this to be influenced by prison early prison release from offenders um mm -hmm. and for us to be looking at, at, at you know overwhelmingly men coming back into family homes or trying to get access to family homes um having been released early from prisons but we kind of waited for this to happen and, and it hasn't it hasn't happened yet um so all of my cases that i'm working on at the moment are domestic violence cases um so so that tells you what what social work is like anyway you know that's that's what it's like it's overwhelmingly the main characteristic of what we're dealing with usually usually you can talk about substance abuse within that you can talk about past trauma because overwhelmingly our families have past trauma so um so i guess we're already overwhelmed with domestic violence cases anyway um i was i was kind of hoping that we would have as a council that we would have specific briefing around how we would manage domestic violence cases given that we can't go inside every home but we haven't had any so there's been there's been no specific instruction but we have been open and waiting we've asked i know that we've asked we've asked to our managers and we're asking our managers to, to feed up the chain but nothing as of yet but then this is reflected really in what we've been getting from social work england um from you know from government uh, advice from baswa um actually it's been very it's been very non-specific and we've talked a lot about um well how to do a virtual visit so interesting ways of doing visits how else could you get you know child's lived experience but there's no broad conversation about you know what what is happening behind closed doors and how might you have a conversation with families about what is happening and how how what other types of evidence are we looking for are we even looking for the right thing i think the conclusion that i've come to is we're not asking the right questions so we're our managers fears are that we'll turn up one day and a child will have got caught in the crossfire and will be seriously injured or worse I mean, that's our mm -hmm. managers fear that's why we're being told it's business as usual you go out and you do every visit you can you do it through a window you do it at the doorstep if you have to you do a virtual visit but we want you to do your visits in time scales because they want to avoid a serious case review yeah but, but that's because they're expecting us to be able to see black eyes and bruising and actually i'm beginning to think we're not asking the right questions because domestic violence is control and this is starting to come out in our national conversation but it's more about lindsay's point around inequalities it's it's a general sense of powerlessness and actually 
the women that I work with are not telling me. I'm not the person that they're telling if they're really worried and frightened. And what does that say about my, my relationship with them? It, it means that they don't trust social work. It yeah. means it, 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 that, that fear that we've all got that maybe all we do is monitor and scare our families is coming true because we're not being told about this domestic, increase in domestic violence that we've all been waiting for. If we're, not if we're not getting the evidence of that, is that because it's not there or is that because we are not the person, the people that they're gonna share it with? So yeah. I, think, um, I think that's really interesting. The support agencies have traditionally been third sector, voluntary sector support agencies. They've, they've increased their telephone capacity, sending, I know that they've sent text messages to my families, but other than that, they've, they've almost disappeared. I know that they say there were refuge spaces, but I also know that they've been really difficult to get hold of. Um, and people are frightened of, of, of shared accommodation. They're frightened of coronavirus. So that's really, that's really difficult, I think, because I don't think we are doing anything to try and capture what's happening around domestic violence. I don't think there is a major conversation or an attempt to gather the evidence. And I don't think there's a unique new approach. I think it's business as usual. Um, and, and people are just keeping their fingers crossed that nothing major happens and that there's yeah. no serious case review at the end of it. Um, so yeah, I think that would be my that would that would be my kind of disturbing conclusions at the moment, really. I don't think we're asking the right questions. Yeah, yeah, I think your point's actually quite fair. Perhaps not asking the right questions, but we've also um it must be very, very difficult for a woman who is a victim of domestic violence to be able to speak to somebody like a social worker when there's so much stigma surrounding that sort of um, the service uh, of social work, but also during COVID, uh, the COVID crisis, when you can't actually have um, support of nurturing relationships because you're doing it at a front door where potentially a perpetrator is also in the house. Um, as well. So yeah, it, it, it seems quite an impossible task based yeah. on, on, on what's available to you right now and perhaps the conclusions that you've come to is that we're not getting a lot of guidance um, and that perhaps we're, we're turning a bit of a blind eye to that. Um, I think individual social workers, and this always happens, individual social workers are trying really, really hard to be imaginative and, and um, gain the child's lived experience in different ways. So we'll, we'll ask them to wander off of the phone. We'll do the bulk of our conversations by telephone. Um, you know, we might post things, you know, pictures and all the rest of it. We'll just be really upfront and we'll start the conversation. Yeah. That's, but, but, it, but if we're not getting increased evidence of DV, yeah. then th that suggests we're not being told that we're still not quite getting it right you know yeah so no i think that they're all very fair points lindsay um thanks so much um can i move on to rebecca now um rebecca you've been an active member of the recently established glasgow covid19 action group um, and I'm just wondering what um, or who you would see as being the most effective, with uh, effective, sorry, the most affected um, people within the workforce um, during the COVID-19 crisis and as the fallout to the COVID-19 crisis as well. Okay, yeah. So um, the COVID-19 kind of Glasgow group, um, their kind of taglines people before profit, and it's all. It's mostly activists and union reps that are involved, but the, you know, lots of representation of essential workers. Um, mm -hmm. While there is relatively good gender balance, especially in terms of um, we've got people from construction, transport, postal workers, um, a lot of people in society that really are underappreciated, underpaid. Um, but we're, it feels like the essential workers are the people that are on the front line are some of the people that are most affected and highly represented within our group as well. So that'd be your teachers, your NHS staff, I'm obviously doing a big overarching NHS mm -hmm. staff there. Um, lots of people come into that category and um, social workers um, yeah. amongst others, but those are the ones that really kind of stick out. Um, I'll speak first about, about those three because they are female dominated um, professions. Um, People like our NHS staff, nurses, for example, um, been a lot of talk about the clap for carers and the COVID-19 action group have done a lot of work around potentially protesting around the clap for carers because while it is um, 
quite well intentioned and people are enjoying it bring people together there is a real kind of troubling aspect to it where it kind of allows us to make our NHS workers and our carers into heroes but it doesn't necessarily remunerate these people on a kind of base, basic level people are still concerned about going into work PPEs maybe come down a little bit maybe relax a wee bit in terms of being having a bit more coming through the door now but for a long time there people were still worried about the level of protection they were going to get at work um, and a lot of this stuff about being on the front line you're coming to work almost like a warfare kind of attitude um, and something interesting I read recently was that that's something similar that happened to the firefighters after 9-11 there was this big outcry these heroes these these people that have done so much for us but these people were often working two jobs and had to yeah. travel vast distances to get to work in places like New York because they couldn't afford to live there. Mm -hmm. I think that says an awful lot about how we really treat these people in society and how our government treats them. All well and good to clap for people, but if they're not okay at home and they're not financially stable, then it means that we're not doing enough, essentially. Um, the other group I've spoke about there as well was teachers. Mm -hmm. So um, if our NHS is made up of about 80% of women, um, I'll tell you where I got that quote from at the end. Um, I think teachers are 80% as well. And um, while they're not currently working, I know a lot of people are doing online teaching to try and support families who are trying to do the homeschooling. A lot of teachers are trying to do that themselves as well, which is uh, probably fun balancing. But yeah. um, we know that the UK government are looking to send teachers back to school on the 1st of June um, and, and start several kids back in several year groups and I know that the National Education Union are really concerned about that and they've they've held rallies the COVID-19 Action Group and the National Education Union which have been really really successful and Jeremy Corbyn spoke at one as well and the Glasgow COVID-19 Action Group have actually teamed up with our Edinburgh um, version <laughs> and so mm -hmm. we're doing a Scotland rally on the 26th of May, shameless plug, Good tune plug. in. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and we're, and we're, we're standing in solidarity with the National Education Union, saying that um, you know it's not good enough, we need to have clear boundaries about what happens before people return to work, because the numbers are still not good. Anyway, I'll not go into too much detail on that, because there's quite a lot online about it. But, um, so, the other group I spoke about there was social workers. I know we've talked a lot about social workers and I, it's really troubling hearing what Alisa said, certainly in terms of social work. Um, and also the women within that as well. Social work's a profession that there's a lot of flexible work and we've got a, a flexi system, which often works really well for people. But we, from my experience in children and families, you know, you're not working nine to five. You're, mm -hmm. you're working all hours and then you bring the anxiety home with you because there's just, there's just not enough services there. We don't have enough workers. We don't have enough resources. And we are a female dominated workforce that work with a majority female clientele, certainly in children and families. A lot of, a lot of women in lone families, um, they don't have the, the structures that were maybe went there 10 years ago prior to austerity to really hold them up. So people are really being penalized for that. And I think that there's a lot to be desired in terms of where social work has moved to through yeah. austerity. Um, I think the example I was looking at earlier was in terms of the child tax credit cuts. Now, while I know that's moved to universal credit, that um, the component, the child component of that, where you can only have two children, is still, is still very much there. And we actually received a training um, maybe a year or so ago in regard to having to assess women for special circumstances. Mm -hmm. So if you have two children and then you're having a third, you want to apply for these benefits, there is the rape clause. And we were told that as social workers, we were going to have to assess women to see whether they've been raped and whether they would be able to get this other benefit. Now, that was, there was a huge outcry from the individual social workers. But I think that that really says a lot about where we've come to in terms of our value base as a society. And mm -hmm. it's very hard for social workers to work within that. Anyway, I'll not talk too much about social work because I want to really talk about the people who I feel are most impacted by COVID-19, which while our frontline workers are absolutely up there, I think that there's people who don't have that same voice. Other predominantly female workforces and carers, we talk about a lot. We talked um, 
certainly more recently, uh, the news talked about the deaths in care homes um, mm -hmm. and the fact that these care homes are all privatised. So these carers are in these jobs who are often, these, these jobs are relatively flexible. Um, I can't speak for all of them, but they often um, are low paid, can be zero hour contracts, they're not well unionised. Mm -hmm. And so their jobs are more precarious and less appreciated. Um, also, other jobs that I feel fall into that category are people like your cleaners. Um, and slightly separately, because I know that they're not frontline workers just now, people in hospitality and hairdressers, yeah. mm -hmm. all majority female workforces, women who often have, often work part time because of caring responsibilities and who could really be plunged into poverty following this. Yeah. And not being spoken about. Yeah, I'm hearing whispers of people who are going to lose their businesses because they can't get they can't get any grants. People who they just have no options. They don't know when they're going to be able to even work again. And what do they do in the meantime? Universal Credit is not supporting these families. Yeah. So um, essentially, in conclusion, the women who are underpaid, underappreciated, and have those care and responsibilities are going to be the people that pay pay for this and are paying for this now yeah yeah thank you well thanks very much Rebecca I think you've you've covered quite a lot of points here um and if we had more time probably we'd be able to kind of pull out even further but you're absolutely right it is these women that are on the front line their carers potentially going forward to people like your catering staff who potentially are not working right now but are they going to have jobs to go back to and I was reading the other day that what we might be seeing is that men who are who would have been prior to COVID-19 working full time, may have to start taking reduced hours. Um, just as your point was there about um, businesses perhaps not being able to keep the, the same amount of staff on. Um, and and the, the victims um, of that are going to be the women who had the part-time contracts in the first place. So when, when people then go back to work, is, is their job going to be there? Um, and, and ultimately, I think, as Lindsay kind of mentioned in the beginning, um, women have um, ha will will have to often uh, balance care and responsibilities with um, with work, um, and if people are um, are struggling, if family members are struggling with with ill health or with COVID nineteen, for example, then it is the women that most likely are going to be having to leave their work to look after um, a, a their family. I mean, I can speak from my own experience that uh, I have been doing most of the childcare within my house. Um, I work part time as well, so I don't know if that's had an impact on it, but I, I can only imagine what it must be like for people who are living um, in poverty that are having to make a choice between looking after family and actually going to work and trying to balance that. And the stress that that has on a person's mental health as well and their wellbeing. Um, so does anybody else want to come in and make any comment on anything that's been discussed before I sum up with a final question? I would just, just listening to Rebecca there, I think one of the other dynamics that, that we've noticed amongst our, our families, amongst our, you know, working class families who are balancing part time work. Sometimes you might have a multi generational household where there's only um, one woman working, you know, bringing in bringing in money because you've got some you've got unemployed men and you've got a, a younger woman who are looking after children and you might have you know, grandparents who are working. I think one of the other dynamics is that um, in terms of social isolation and in terms of being able to stay risk-free, you know, or minimize the risk of the virus coming into your home, what we've noticed is that um, women tend to be quite good at isolating and, and keeping the children safe, but, but men are still going out into the community. They might be going out um, doing cash in hand work you know, like yeah. there's been a lot of, I don't know, gardening, clearing stuff, just general like, you know, cash in hand stuff. They might be uh, more likely to visit friends. They might be more likely to go out looking for the drugs or the alcohol that they use regularly. They might be more likely to be involved in petty crime or not so petty crime. And they're bringing, they're, they're bringing the risk back into the family home. And I think that's a dynamic, that's one dynamic that I've really noticed. And, and then part of my role has been to try and challenge how well that child's being safeguarded by people coming by the house being you know porous if you like and i think that's another element um that we need to be aware of is behavior behavior is very different and, and, and 
you know, patterns of interaction, social interaction are very different for men and women, what they need from their communities, where they go, where they get their resources from and bring it back into the house mm -hmm. plays out differently. And the risk in, in a pandemic therefore is, you know, is really different. And who do we turn to at, and the first, you know, is protecting the children. It's always the mum. It's always the mum. The mum who engages with social services, the, the dads just take a step back, either take a step back, step back or, or like, <laughs> like off the cliff, take a step back. Um, yeah. So we're always trying to engage with the women in the household. And so it's a double, that's a double burden, isn't it? You know? Yeah, I think, I think your point's fair. I think also there's a bit of a culture. I certainly, I mean, I've been out of social work for a few years now, but I wonder if it's changed that much, that if when it comes to domestic violence, that we, we, in terms of, you know, a male perpetrator, we look immediately to the woman to fix that yeah, situation yeah. and to bring them round a table and talk about the impact of that um, violence on their children as if it is their responsibility um, to, to fix that, you know, and, and often, ha I've often seen um, at child protection uh, meetings, men, male perpetrators being excluded from um, taking on that responsibility or taking that responsibility that is them that has committed this uh, and has has put their children through that and then we sort of almost re-victimise if I can say that women during that experience um, and I think I think going forward that culture needs to change and that, that responsibility needs mm -hmm. to be um, put on to the, the, the man that may well be the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I, you know, I think with all of these, you're talking about a structure of society which really doesn't work. And that the family obviously is a, is, is a source of great comfort and love and everything else for people, but it's a very imperfect structure. And therefore, you know, there are many, many ways in which it doesn't work. And of course, when you have a situation like now, you suddenly see, I mean, you see it in your profession, you see it a lot of the time, but... Um, you suddenly see that these things really don't work and that and what is needed after this is a very very big system change you know that a very very big change in how the in how the whole situation works in the way in which people are regarded in the way in which childcare is regarded which is you know essentially what they're doing with the schools is saying is saying you have to send the children back on June the first. Which ones do they want to go back? They want the youngest, the early years to go back. Why is that? They want this to happen so that their parents can go to work because they're the ones that are most difficult to leave at home or to, you know, you can't leave them at home at that age and you can't, you know, whereas if they're 13, you probably would or lots of people. I'm not suggesting you should, but yeah, lots of people probably would. So this is, it's a very functional thing. The schools, we're always told the schools are about education. But actually, what this crisis has shown is that they are hugely important mm -hmm. as a sort of childcare. as a safety net, you know, as childcare, as mm -hmm. as it's spotting the problems that you then have to deal with and liaising with 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 people like yourselves, you know. And I think it's, I think loads of people have said we can't come out of this in the same way, you know. We don't want society to go back to what it was like, but of course, the government still wants it to go back to what it was like yeah. really and I, there's lots and lots of questions here which obviously go beyond what we're even talking about I mean the question of housing how can you you know you look at people's housing how can you have children they go on about children aren't being schooled properly at home when you haven't got a computer you've probably yeah. got several children might be sharing a bedroom you know you're not in a position to do these sorts of things so I think it raises all these sorts of big questions mm -hmm. to which you know we I think we need as well to think about some answers i mean i'm not saying now but you know we need to think okay why is it is society structured in the way it is it's not, it's not logical yeah why does it have to be that there's this privatized family where everything as you say falls onto the woman particularly yeah. not exclusively but obviously very very heavily and that's still the case yeah and also, also doing huge amounts of work you know yeah i think that, that you pretty much sum up that it's the lack of social safety net this kind of capitalist idea exponential growth keep going the only way is up we're leaving people behind there's so much collateral damage that the system can't doesn't know how to deal with it um, and it seems like this is the time to try and 
get people involved in seeing if there can be another way because I think people haven't been able to see that there is another way because mm. things like um, communism and socialism these are all very dirty words and I'm not saying that I have a perfect solution but I think we see that something's very very wrong here and hopefully we'll be able to keep getting that message out. These things aren't okay. It's not okay that this domestic violence is under is, is going on. Social services are meant to be there to protect people, for example, but we we don't even know what's going on. It's these helplines that are that are putting this message forward. Oh, we had to double the amount of thirty three times the amount of calls than we did last month. So something's going on. We're not seeing it. We don't know how it fixes it. And then we've got a mental health crisis on the horizon. And what happens to the children in those houses? Yeah. Do they go on to do the same things? I also f always find it difficult thinking about the men. You're talking there about bringing the men in and putting more responsibility on the men, but the social stigma is so huge. There's such this undercut, this culture of, well, you don't say that you did it because our, our whole legal system is based around the fact that if you say you didn't, you might get away with it. And if you say you did, <laughs> If you're owning up to it, you're definitely going to get done. So it's like there isn't a positive, good way for people to try and reintegrate into society if they are people who perpetrate domestic violence. Where is our groups and our workshops to help people understand that this is that there are other ways? Mm. Because I, can't, I mean, I'm not a domestic abuser. I don't really know what it is to be one, but I can't imagine it feels good to be that guy. I think what's interesting is there are pockets of really good practice. Uh, we're, we're incredibly fortunate that we've got a couple of resources within the local authority, uh, you know, run by the local authority, paid for by the local authority, that work hand in hand with someone like myself. We'll do joint work with families where we will go in and do really intensive therapeutic work with that family who clearly wants to stay together. And we'll start with the starting point of, so you want to stay together. So how do we do that? How do we get there? Yeah. And there are pockets of really, really good practice going on. Um, those teams tend to be very good at spotting where um, need is causing a problem. And, and so they don't, they don't make it about positive psychology or about rethinking the way out of this. They make this about what are the problems at home we need to address to make you feel better about yourself? And then how do we look at how you interact as a couple? And we need to get those, those need to be, you know, uh, bankrolled, just, just paid for as, you know, whatever you need, we'll pay for it. And we'll just keep those pockets of uh, good practice going. We need to not be so protective about them. Local authorities feel like they're so competitive with each other, you know, to retain their workforce, hold on to their budgets. How many times do you get cases coming through where you're like, well, why is this, why are these people moving over the boundary? Can't they stay in that local authority? <laughs> You know, like we're so protective because it's we've been yeah. picked against each other. That yeah. we, I think the answers are out there. I think I think these conversations have been written about in you know ten thousand books. It's mm. it's making the men in government listen to us and make the women in government our allies. We're just hitting this brick wall, and I think that's the bit that I get really frustrated about is how do we actually achieve a long-term change? Because they know it, we keep saying it, this isn't new, you know. But I've got the answer to the end of that sentence. <laughs> it's very interesting hearing you say that because it sounds like lots of the things that teachers do with children who have particular problems where you essentially have one-to-one -one or one-to-two mm -hmm. teaching. The same with intensive care in hospitals. You know, somebody's really, really ill, you have one nurse looking after you while you're in intensive care. Now, this all costs a huge amount of money. Mm. So that's, you know, when you look at the bottom line, if you had a society where people start saying, well, okay, you know, the, there are these children with huge problems, whatever we think, where we think they come from, you know, uh, whether it's to do with things that have happened to them or whether it's things that have happened to their parents or whatever, they need a huge amount of interest, care, resources whatever i mean i'm you know you're the experts on all this i'm not Investment. But yeah no it, it is and you just feel this isn't happening and again when you hear in places where it does happen it obviously has big it results does. 
yeah, when you hear it in school, special units that are dealing with some of the children that have these real difficulties, they really do incredibly well. Even just in London, where they have special money for children who don't have English as their first language, makes a big difference to their academic achievement. Who knew? You know, it's not, it's not a surprising thing. But of course, everyone says, oh, we don't have the money. And I'm sure, you know, when you say about the rivalry between different councils and different social work, you know teams a lot of this is to do we don't have the money what can mm. we manage to do you've got to do more work you've got to manage more cases because otherwise nobody else will do them because we haven't got enough social workers to do it you know and that's going through right across the right across the board i mean i'm in higher education it's you know i wouldn't say for a moment it has any of the same kind of problems but there are all sorts of things where you think if only you had the time or the resources to mm -hmm. put into this particular problem mm -hmm. you or think about how you could teach in a different way which is what they're demanding that we all do now because we have to go online yeah. you know mm -hmm. it's uh, you don't have the time to kind of you don't have the bandwidth if you like to think about what needs to be done and a lot of that would be dealt with by more resources mm. but that's a tactic isn't it they just keep you so incredibly overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. you, don't have, you don't have time to, to look at where the real problem lies. And yeah, you know, Becca's discussion about um, underpaid, undervalued um, key workers, everybody knows that the British public actually has got, uh, the British public knows that our essential workers are not the bankers and are not the people propping up, propping up the economy. The, the public <laughs> knows it. And I think the clap for carers thing is interesting because I think part of that is actually a mini protest it's it's people who aren't politically active saying those are the people i value in my society it's not it's not the it's not the bankers so i think there's a real awareness of it it's if we could just get those stories in the media and get the media to acknowledge that that's how the mm -hmm. public feel and then maybe eventually it'll filter out to, but those are the people that the public want funded they, yeah. don't, they don't object i don't think the public object quite as much as the daily mail or yeah. Yeah. say that they do, you know, don't see <laughs> You guys are absolutely right. I think you're looking at bigger picture stuff here, and probably as a nation of, of, of British people, in many ways, we are a nation of very oppressed people. When we look at other nations and how they respond to austerity, um, um, we don't respond in the same way uh, and, and we are pitched against one another and the media probably does have a lot to do with that and, and takes a big role in that. Um, so yeah um I, I should probably sum it up now a little you guys have been really this discussion has been really really good and um we could probably talk all day about it i just wondered <laughs> what uh, yeah what taking things forward um swan is a social work action network so what are the actions we're going to be looking at taking forward so just individually i wonder if you could um have a think about what immediate demands um, SWAN should be making of our government, of our local authorities, of our social work services, sub-sector providers um, to alleviate some of the worst examples of oppression against women during this lockdown as we're phased out of it, but also going forward as well, what you um, guys think. I'll maybe come to Lindsay first. Okay, well, um... I mean, I think you can't separate this out from, from the question, as we were just saying, of, of resources. I don't want to put it all down to money. It's obviously not all down to money, that there are still big problems in societies where people do have access to, to these things. But there is a huge issue here, not just in terms of are there enough resources to deal with these immediate problems. I mean, it was raised the whole question of mental health a little while ago. I think, um, was it you, Rebecca, who... who raised it and i mean again i'm not an expert in this but from what i know of people that i know and what i read it is a massive massive crisis and most of it is completely hidden from wider society or it's they try to hide it from wider society and uh, and i think we've got to say look we've got to have the money i was listening to the radio which says that jaguar land rover is asking the government for one billion pounds to bail it out of the present crisis now i don't want to get into whether we think this is we should be bailing out jaguar land rover but why should they get a billion pounds and yet a particular city council can't get even a hundred million to for emergency services so i think there's got to be a real 
input into um, public services and public funding. And this should be a center of what we do. It's so important and it's so central to any healthy, decent society. You can't have a, a healthy society where people have these kind of problems where we have inequality and poverty and all these kind of things. So that would be my, that would be my first very modest demand. So, um, you know, and the second thing I think is we, ca we do have to stop undervaluing work, which is some of the most valuable work in the world. And bringing up children is extremely difficult, extremely challenging. Why is it that either you do it for nothing, which is what millions of people do, or you're some of the lowest paid if you work in a nursery or if you're a childminder or a nanny or any of those sorts of things. I think we're going to say we want to, we want to start valuing these jobs, valuing them not just financially, but in terms of status. I'm fed up with the whole stuff about unskilled workers. Mm. I mean, to me, any job requires a skill. Mm, now, of course, yeah. if you're a brain surgeon, it requires more skill than, you know, than the job that I do. But they all require... They all require skills and cleaning a house requires skills. You can do it badly or you can do it well. Serving coffee, you can learn a skill of how to do it well. And this whole idea, what it really means is we're going to pay you the minimum wage if you're lucky, yeah. and give you a zero hours contract. So those are the two things I think that'll, that'll do to, for starters would be my view. Mm. Thanks so much, Lindsay. Uh, Elisa, I'll come to yourself. Yeah, I think I would uh, agree with all of that. I think my two points, I like that we're doing a two point model here. That's worked well for me. Um, <laughs> really, I, would, I think I'm, I'm begging the Labour Party and big unions to, um, to reach out to our local authorities and build, build alliance and build their confidence in challenging the government. Because, because even those of us who work in, um, you know not Tory strongholds our employers don't feel able to challenge the government's way of doing things so it feels very odd to 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 work in an area that didn't vote conservative but where there's no challenge to the conservative way of handling this pandemic so i'm i'm begging those those major organizations to to speak to local authorities about how they can support them to challenge the status quo to use to use money differently, to use money more imaginatively, and to not feel restricted to, to pleasing their masters and, and the people they go to begging cap in hand for money with, because that's that's what it's been reduced to. I think if you if you do that and you can boost the confidence of our of our local councillors and then of the people who run our services, what you'll get further down as it you know as it hopefully trickles down, yeah. would you would get a new conversation around domestic violence. You would get workers who felt able to say, um, "I'm not going to. I'm not prepared to put up with the sentence. What are you doing to protect your children from the impact of domestic violence?" I would not accept that anymore in any more conferences that I have to sit in because it's an unacceptable sentence. Choosing. You don't choose to protect or not protect your children from domestic violence. It is far more complicated than that. You're choosing the, you know, the lesser of two evils at any given moment, you know? So I think the conversation would change if we were given that confidence and we were told you will not be punished ridiculously for trying to do things in a different way, in a more compassionate way, you know, that we talk about, openly talk about inequality. Very few people write the word poverty in any assessment that they do in social work. And it, it, it shocks me. It's not a, yeah. it's not a, a conversation. People talk about not having any money, but they don't, they don't talk about what it's like to live on that estate. You know, what it's like for your children to listen to somebody else's domestic argument happening in the flat next door. The fact that you are waiting five years for a council house, you know? So I think if, if, if the big agencies can do what Swan are trying to do, if they can embolden people and say, we'll stand beside you, we'll stand alongside you, we will back you all the way. Then slowly but surely, we would have confidence to talk about domestic violence in a new way, and that would yeah. protect children and families, men and women. That would protect everybody. Thanks so much, Elisa. That's brilliant. Um, finally, Rebecca, um, what are you demanding of the government? And uh, local uh, so I like the two-point model, but I started to scribble things down, and what I've written here is. I want the people to get angry, get involved in politics and change things. So I think I might have gone two steps ahead. <laughs> um, All right. I think um, there's a lot of lip service. We need the government to get their priorities right. 
It all feels a little bit difficult now. The UK government got Tory in power. In power. We had a leaked Labour do document calling people Trotskys, saying essentially get them out, kick, kicking out Jeremy Corbyn. It's very hard to see how this stuff's going to happen without us all saying it is just not okay. Women can't be second class citizens. Children can't be seen as this unimportant. We need yeah. to change. We end poverty. Like it's just in this country, first world country, there's no reason for it. The inequality is just completely unacceptable. So to take it back a step, we need to have safe working environments, clear guidelines, PPE, but we also need to have a well-funded public service. We need people to be able to access what they need and have the services that they need from people who can give it without being completely burnt out and, and not being able to actually offer any sort of real service because they have no time. So we just need to do better and we need to get our priorities right. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, all right, guys, I'll um, just conclude it there. Thanks so much for your time and for putting so much thought and effort into today. Um, don't, I don't doubt that people that um, are, are SWAN members and people that, that uh, are on the website watch this will take away quite a lot of, of um, points and perhaps actions to take forward. Um, it was really nice to meet you all and talk to you all. I'll hopefully get a chance to do that again in the future. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks, you, Laura. Thank you. Bye. Bye.